programmers and designers working together, what could that mean? No, it's not the apocalypse. I wanted to take you through a technique that I've used in the past um, to try and get a, a game design that could actually be implemented. So the big question is, how do we turn a game design document into a product, into a game? And we're doing this from the point of view of a programmer, but this can actually help game designers as well. So we want to basically produce a software design from the game design. So the typical case is the designer produces this plain English design document and they put in it whatever they think is appropriate and you know the better ones try and consider what what they need to change so they can tell the, the programmer you know how to expose these different things they want to play with but it's hard for a game design to know how things are implemented unless they're sort of ex-programmers and designers and those kind of things so we generally get quite a sort of quite a journey in terms of the design document skills and certainly my experience is that we had huge game design documents that literally nobody had read. So like we had 500 plus pages of design document and the 12 designers that had worked on this document, not one of them had read all the way through, which kind of tells you that that's not quite the right way to do it. So one of the things we do is when we get a de design document, we want the, the, designer to give us a, basically their plain English version of what they want and the idea is that we use this thing called noun verb analysis as a programmer and you can do this with designers and artists as well we try and use this to identify the kind of things that we want to understand as programmers um, so it's a pretty simple process and I'll guide you through an example in a second but the idea is that we do this as a sort of iterative process. So um, the analysis is really just a method of clarifying what the design should say. And it'll help you in later doing the software engineering design, but it also should help iterate the design process. Um, so think of this as a sort of a cooperative process and, and you're not far off. The idea is that we take the design and we create something that's more um, palatable for a programmer to work from. So let's take this example, simple text-based description of what a game might be like, and you might be able to understand what the game I'm talking about here, you know, the type of genre I'm talking about might be. And the first section is, okay, so we look at this English language text and we try and identify all of the nouns so in this case we take that text and we say okay so we'll put all of the nouns in red and all that means is that we go through the text and we try and say what is a, a noun what is a, a an object a sort of thing um, and obviously you have to use a bit of common sense in how you analyze these things so, for instance, it says with the player controlling a squad of characters, and then it talks about a squad member. So you might just have squad member or character to mean both of those things because they're actually the same thing. And obviously, you know, once you've figured out if you've seen it once, you don't need to necessarily cover it again. But the idea is for you to take, go through that sort of list of, of English and try and identify the, the nouns, the objects. So in my case, my list was something like this. And think, in terms of a programmer, what you might be looking at is, okay, so maybe these are the sort of classes of, of things that I might need to program. And that's a useful, a good starting point, but we're not going to stop there. So we'll do the, the next one. So we, we've done the nouns, let's have a look at the verbs. And we do the same process with the verbs. We look for the verbs in the text, and maybe we color them in slightly differently. Now, in the past, I've done this this kind of thing on paper and just used like the highlighter markers in different colors to say what each part is. So you can do it that way, or if you've got an electronic document, you can do like a, a coloring kind of thing. So this is my list of verbs, and, and think about that, what we're talking about here. 
we've got a set of objects and we've got a set of interactions that those objects can do. So we've got essentially the start of a bunch of methods that we can start thinking about for our good design. And um, when I first did this exercise many years ago, I didn't do this version of it, but I thought, well, it would be useful to extend the noun verb analysis and actually look for variables, but this is kind of hard for a designer to do and sometimes hard for a, a sort of beginner programmer to do. Let's just go through this and see if we can identify any variables. Now, I've identified a few of them here, and I've actually sort of said what I think those variables actually mean. So occasionally means that something's going to happen with a certain frequency. Turn, in this case, means that there's a token to say who's currently in control. Odd, in the context of that text, means how often something's going to ha happen. Um, visible is just a flag to say whether something's been um, is visible or not, and detected is a, a boolean that says whether something has been detected. So we can say, okay, so we've got the nouns and the verbs, and we maybe have the variables as well. So what that should do is it should lead to a set of questions that you can then give back to designers. Or maybe you work with designers to try and identify those kind of questions. But it should lead to a sort of a discussion about actual useful features of these things. So if you look at the objects, one of, one of the questions might be is how big is this galaxy? We know there's a galaxy object. What does it do? How big is it? How many things can it contain? Does it have any sort of properties of its own? Does it do something to the things in it? That kind of thing. Um, so you can go through each object and try and identify aspects that need clarification. So this is, a, 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 a remember, this is an iterative process. So the guy, the designer might take these questions and redo that design document. And then maybe you go through the design document again and mark up the new things that he said, and maybe you identify new objects and new nouns, new verbs, new variables, and that kind of thing. So do this iteration. And the idea is that you, you iterate on that process, and you should have a bunch of nouns and verbs and, and variables that you have identified. Um, the point of all of this really is to t try and train your designers to do this kind of thing before they, well, as they're doing the design. Um, it's easy to start with a lot of text-based waffle, you know, and the guys who did the 500 page design documents that I've read obviously did a huge amount of waffle and didn't actually give us an implementable design. And we actually threw it back at them and said, yeah, we're not going to read that. Give us 10 pages of what we're going to do for the next month. So that's really the, the question is that we're trying to get designers and to understand that the implementation process needs very specific design elements to be discussed in the design document. Um, but this is a, a collaborative effort. So the point of, of doing this is that you want to try and train everybody involved to think about how things are implemented rather than the designer's kind of temptation to think about narrative and theme and, and all of the background fluff actually doesn't make you, doesn't enable you to implement something as a programmer or even as an artist, actually. So the idea is that um, once we've done that design document kind of um, fix up and we've, we've identified a bunch of noun verbs and, and variables, we can take that in newly sort of um, newly developed design document that's a little bit more specific and we can attempt to turn that design document into a set of functional requirements. So we're taking the, the text-based description and using our knowledge of the, the nouns and the verbs and the variables and we're going to transform that into what we call a functional requirements list. And the functional requirements essentially are um, a bunch of implementation requirements. 
and you can think of them as a set of features that need to be need to work for the game to work so um what we do is for a functional requirement we create as ideally and i'll give you an example um a one-line description of a particular bit of functionality and so in this case the player will press a key and the player's current weapon sorry the, and the player's current character will fire a projectile from their currently i should have probably put equipped weapon and the, the point about all of this is that um we're trying to create a bunch of requirements that can be used for production um so we want it to be as complete as possible so if there's a requirement that you must be able to shoot with a mouse you must be able to shoot with a keyboard well okay so we create two functional requirements the foot you know the player must be able to press a mouse button and fire from the current weapon a player must be able to press a key and fire from the current weapon and the reason why we do that is that we can then test whether that functionality is there or not it's a feature that has to be executed for the game to function so it's a functional requirement and we're trying to be as complete as possible because that will let us know how much work we've got left to do we can create functional requirements for everything we can know how much work we've got and maybe we can cut features if we need to but again this is an iterative design process it might be that we do it um in a just-in-time method i.e we do the parts that are just required for the current section of gameplay and the point of functional requirements is that they try and break down into production oriented tasks and they could be art tasks they could be programmer tasks they could be designer tasks so don't think of this as a programmer only thing um, but the ideal is that we turn these functional requirements and we do the nva the, the analysis we turn that into a software engineering design and the best bit about all of this is that these functional requirements if we document them they can be tested they can be independently verified so you know in our case we used to get QA to go down the functional requirements and say yes this one works and no that one doesn't and we wrote down a list of functional requirements we'd completed for the week or whatever and what we're going to do for the next week so it's basically um, the production process that you would use in something like scrum it's just sort of written down as little tasks little functional requirement tasks the other part of this is that uh, and it's probably something you haven't come across until you work on a platform like a console but even the smartphone manufacturers have the same thing every platform holder has a set of requirements that they need for your product to go on that platform so um they call them technical desire requirements or technical requirement certifications or a bunch of other things but they are things like you know you can't have text near the edge of a screen because the screen might be a tv and in the old days the tv wouldn't actually display that text at that point so there was a whole, always a bunch of guidelines that the platform hold and it would be give you a huge book that you have to make sure you've fulfilled all their requirements so it makes sense to have their requirements rolled into the functional requirements you're creating for the product which means that you develop the product with the requirements in mind and you know there's all sorts of platform stuff like what happens if the the player pulls out a joystick uh, you know what do you show on screen what if they plug it back in what if they pull another one out and then plug the first one back in all that kind of thing so the, the whole point of this is that you do the noun verb analysis and you create the function requirements and what you're trying to do is you're trying to massage them into a software design for the programmers but also a production plan you know a, a sort of gantt chart or um a scrum sort of burn down chart or something like that that you can control those things but you've got to remember that this all requires a lot of practice you you won't get it right on the first attempt so keep iterating that process and it might be that some of these things don't work for you some of the things work better than others but when you're working in teams it's important to try and find out what does work for you because that will make you a lot more productive when you're developing things and don't leave this kind of planning and, and analysis stuff um, too late because you know it's all about kind of getting your design in place and getting your plans together 
So, to wrap up, basically we're taking the English language design document, we're doing the noun verb analysis, we use the noun verb analysis to help create functional requirements, we use the noun verb analysis of functional requirements to create the software design. Obviously we're basically using the nouns as classes, the verbs as methods, the variables as variables in those classes. We create a software engineering design from that, hopefully informed by the rest of the functional requirements. We then use the functional requirements to try and produce a production plan to help us implement those features. So essentially the production plan tells us what we need those classes to be able to do. The functional requirements should identify all of those requirements um, and hopefully you create the, the functional requirements in such a way that the programmer can literally tick a list off the things that each particular part of code needs to do. Um, but it's important to iterate on that process and see what works for you and, and try the things that do work and throw out the things that don't and look for other alternatives. But that's one of the experiences I had and I thought it was worth taking you through it. Um, Try doing this kind of thing, look for other methods, but it's really important to get your planning right and get it right early in the project. So highly recommend you doing this. If you have any questions, just contact me. You can obviously come to my office or whatever, contact me through email, contact me through Twitter. Um, but hopefully this should get you on the way to making great games. And hopefully you should be able to produce better design documents from this as well. So thanks for watching and I'll catch you later.